The future of progressive radio. This is the Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. And welcome back. Dean Obadala Show. Angry night. Wednesday, April 24th. I've been angry all day. I was angry yesterday. It's building with anger. I'm trying to get beyond this. And it's anger at the impotence. Because I want the Democrats to do the right thing. And in the studio right now to help us make sense of it, we'll take some calls, I promise you. Julian Zelizer, CNN contributor, Princeton University professor, author of an encyclopedia of numbers of books. So many books out there. His last one, Fault Lines with Kevin Cruz, is a great book. Julian, I was just sharing with Julian the reality. The progressive yeah. base is like me. On Thursday, report comes out, kind of torn. What do we do? Some actually called in Democrats and said, move on. And let's focus on winning 2020. And part of me felt that a little teeny bit. I had slightly digested the report. By Friday, that kind of sentiment had gone away. Debate impeachment or just have hearings. What do you do? It's come back Monday after the weekend, after reading it all and going through it. It's been the phone lines have been very, very clear. Democrats want a bold approach. They want Most, I'm not going to say all, but most want impeachment like hearings. They want to hear the word impeachment. And the point is we work so hard to win the House back. And if you're not going to do this, then you're no different than the Paul Ryan GOP controlled House. If you're going to just be like, well, it's terrible what he did, but, you know, it's not the words I would have chosen and then do nothing. Yes. Julian, what's your response as a historian? As a, I think, I mean, as a historian, I think there's a really strong case to be made, and I've written this, uh, to proceed with impeachment proceedings. And I think the weight of the report was pretty heavy. Uh, and the more you read it, the more you digest it. Uh, you see that it lays out a case for obstruction of justice, and then you read it again, and you see the first part isn't so easy on the I Trump know, campaign. isn't it? Right. So it's serious. It's a serious matter, and you add this to everything else that he has done, including what he's done since the report came out. You see him exercising his uh, presidential power. I think the House has a big choice. I understand the difficulty. They're thinking politically. The speaker is what, what well, to we'll do. We'll break that down. We can I- break it down. Uh But I I think there's a serious case at this point to be made that the House has a responsibility, put the politics aside, to move to some kind of proceeding. I don't know if an interim hearing is going to work because we're watching what he's going to do to that. He's going to stop. I'd be so surprised if Bill Barr actually ends up – Bill Barr is scheduled to come the AG May 1st and 2nd. Uh, Trump's words today, and I'll play it in a second, about no, we're not going to greet any subpoena and we're not going to let people testify. I wonder if he'll stop Bill Barr. And, and if he did, would that be enough for Democrats to go, we got to call these impeachment hearings? So let's let, let have you obstruct impeachment hearings in front of America. Maybe that means something more. He might. Uh, he might send Bill Barr because uh, Barr has been a very good person to advocate for the Trump side in a right. civil way, at least it looks that way. It does. So I don't know if he wants to uh, use him uh, as a tool that way. Um, but I don't think you're going to get much more from the administration. They are not going to turn papers over. They are not going to turn witnesses over. That's just uh, a, a dream if Democrats think all that's coming. Is it fair to say, am I misplaced in my concerns that with Mueller gone, Trump is more unleashed now than ever? It might be that Mueller's gone, or it might be he is really scared. I, I do think the uh, president feels the threat that is now facing him. And I think he is a fighter. And when you attack him, when you insult him, he unleashes everything he has. He doesn't feel any restraint because of being president. It's not who he is. That's in some ways the essence of the report. So he will come after everyone uh, with hammer and tong and try to rip people apart and try to obstruct this uh, investigation into obstruction. That's what's going to happen. When you went through the report, what were things that jumped out at you that maybe you didn't know or you didn't know the extent or depth of it until you read it in the report? Well, I, I remember I read it on, uh, I was on, on a radio show, so I was reading it as the show progressed. <laughs> and uh, the first part was as surprising to me, um, just the the number of contacts and where President Trump or, or candidate Trump told Mike Flynn to find the emails. There is always this myth that he didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. And I read the first part. He certainly knew what was going on. And the campaign knew what was out there and what they were trying to collect. And kind of the cumulative weight of all the stories in the first part, it didn't totally surprise me. 
uh, but it made a stronger argument than I thought was in there. And then the obstruction is just each single instance, uh, him trying to get uh, McGann to fire Mueller. It's, it, it, there, there's the smoking gun, and I always wonder if that will do anything. Well, it's interesting, but, though, when you think yeah. about what Barr told us in a way. There were no yeah. obstru- we've had no yeah. problem with obstruction. Not telling us there were 10 different episodes, 10, right. 10 that Mueller identified. And I made the point in reading his letter that there were more, it was clear there were more than one instant in, yeah. instance of this because they went back and forth on it, they said. And to me, one of the most stunning things was that in the first part, is that Mueller concluded that Russia perceived Trump would be more beneficial if he won, and Trump concluded it would be in his best interest electorally to yep. use the help from Russia. Right. And then also the Trump Tower meeting, there was dirt that we had never heard of before, and it barely gets covered. I, I don't know why. It's not the biggest deal. It's not a smoking gun. But, you know, we they had that meeting, and we heard things like, well, they thought there was going to be dirt from the Russian government. It turned out to be a talk about adoption. But in reality, what they were offered by these right. guys is Ziff Brothers, who's never, ever heard of. And it's still not covered because people, when I mention Ziff Brothers, people are like, what are you talking about? I go, they were told at the meeting, Donald Trump Jr., that the Ziff Brothers, these Russian criminals who had laundered money, had laundered some through the DNC and the Clinton, administra- Clinton campaign. And then Donald Trump Jr. asked for evidence of it, and they had, didn't couldn't produce what he needed. And it actually said in the Mueller report, he was annoyed. They actually had this emotional state in the report. And that's when Jared goes, what are we even doing here? Yeah. And that they were offered something. And that could have been from the Russian government, to be honest. It could have been the Russian right. government going, give them this. Let's see where this leads type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And and Mueller went through it. And then even in, noted this is something that opposition research is of value. It's a campaign contribution. But discounted the idea of willfully and knowingly understanding what they were doing, and I'm not going to prosecute. Donald Trump Jr. should have been charged with a crime. I, I have to be blunt. And then you take that first part, and then you think, okay, what was he obstructing? What was the heart of what he's obstructing? And and as you see the seriousness of what was going on and why all these intelligence uh, agents were worried about what was happening in the campaign— this obstruction is very serious. I, I think it's different than the Clinton obstruction charges because uh, this was a serious amount of interference going on. It wasn't conspiratorial, maybe, but it was clearly a, a pretty intimate back and forth between high level members and uh, people connected to the Russian government. And so then that's what he was obstructing. And he didn't obstruct it once. He didn't obstruct it twice. He did it over and over behind the scenes. There's stories in the second part about trying not to leave a paper trail or leave a fake paper trail. And then you take that and you have to add the Twitter stream where he was openly trying to intimidate witnesses. Michael Cohen, that's completely right. filled the elements of witness intimidation. I had Danny right. Zavallis on last night. We yeah. talked about it. The, all the elements of the federal statute for witness intimidation are fulfilled. And even Mueller makes the point, even if, you're, if someone was debating either way, when you get to the point that Donald Trump talked about Michael Cohen's father-in-law, there's no good faith basis anywhere in the world to bring up the guy's father. Maybe you should look at his father-in-law. That There's nothing you can say. No yeah. lawyer, no defense lawyer, not even Rudy Giuliani could make any straight face argument. That was anything but saying to Cohen that if you do anything more, I'm going to expose all your wrongdoing and maybe make life difficult through my DOJ or whatever for your father-in-law and your entire family. That was Godfather 2 stuff. That was right out of witness intimidation. Yep. That fulfill, that's a crime, on it, and it's also obstruction. It's two crimes. There's no doubt there are crimes here. That's why I'm so angry at what's going on. And by the way, when you, when you think about this, Bill Clinton's ultimate goal was to have some sexual encounters with Monica Lewinsky, and he lied as a result of all of that. Donald Trump's goal was to win the White House with the help of the Russians right. and had no problem accepting their help, asking Russia, can you hear me if you're listening, coordinating within their campaign. It's even the Mueller report, WikiLeaks dumps, trying to use them to help them. And they even knew by October 2016 that WikiLeaks, all their data was stolen by Russian military ha- government hackers. And for the next month, over 100 times, Trump is touting WikiLeaks. Yeah. It's a terrible story, and and you look at the whole thing, and as a historian, I think back, well, what did Watergate look like? And and this is as bad, really is as bad, if not worse, in terms of a pre 
uh, Judiciary Committee hearing report as you're going to get. Uh, and again, I'm not even including all the other things that have already emerged, including conflict of interest uh, stories between the business and his policies, all this stuff. Uh, and so I think it's kind of clear cut. I don't think the report is very mysterious. It's not subtle. The issue is what do Democrats do? Republicans have made it clear in general they're going to let it go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, even exactly. though some, I mean, look, George Conway wrote, uh, <laughs> we have to impeach. And there's a few other conservatives who have come out for impeachment, which is significant. Um, but it's really what do Democrats do? And I think there's a few who say not enough there to trigger this very serious process that should definitely be reserved for worst case scenarios. There's others who are saying politically they're just terrified that they do this. They screw up the election and 220 will go the wrong way. And then I think there's a substantial number of others, and you're hearing more of them, who say, we don't really have a choice. And I don't know where the politics go, go, but as a party, sometimes you have to stand on principle and you have to see this through. In Hillary Clinton's op-ed that she wrote for the Washington Post, it came out just a couple of hours ago before we went on air, in a lot of it, it's nothing stunning. She does not call for an impeachment vote. She says Trump, the Mueller document, serious crimes by Trump against all Americans, in fact. And she even admits, I have a personal interest in this type of thing. But she calls on Americans and even the Republicans to be patriotic over being partisan, which sounds great. I don't know if it moves anyone there. But, you know, if you look at it, let's look at the politics of it historically. And you wrote a great article for CNN about Democrats don't be afraid of impeachment. So what happened in the, the two recent... We almost had impeachment of Nixon. We actually didn't. But 1998, Bill Clinton is technically impeached in the House. They have the trial in the Senate. And there's this great talk in the media. That, oh, my God, the Republicans got crushed in the election because they were so partisan. I think Newt Gingrich was the real loser in all of that. He was forced out. But tell us politically what happened in the 1998 election and then the 2000 election that was so horrible to the Republicans they impeached Bill Clinton, who was a very popular president. It's not like Trump. The guy had like 65% approval rating. In fact, I had the timeline, thank courtesy of CNN, in in the middle of this, in like October, November 1998, October around there, he was at his highest approval rating. So what happened politically in 1980, the midterm election in November 1998. Yeah, so in 98, Republicans do take a hit. There's a lot of things going on, and, and their majority gets smaller. Uh, they lose, I think, five seats, um, which isn't what happens usually in midterms. Right. They keep the majority, though. They don't lose the majority. It's not a wave election. So they come out still in control. And of they Congress. didn't lose the Senate. They didn't lose the Senate. And then in 2000, as we know, uh, George W. Bush will win the presidency with the help of a Supreme Court decision. And it's clear Al Gore is weakened uh, uh, as a candidate uh, because of the ties to the scandal and to the administration. I mean, the economy's doing very well. Clinton's enormously popular, but he can't win. So Republicans stay in control of Congress and the White House till 2006. Um, Isn't so that remarkable? It's remarkable. Republicans after, had Congress yeah, after the six years after. All right. So this kind of weird fairy tale spun Eight by years, some people yeah. that. The Republicans got crushed in the election afterwards because of this. They didn't get crushed at all. Right. They went, they held everything. Right. No, so they, it's not th true. It's not true. It's right. not that, true. That's a false media. Folks, yeah. that's, if you're following along at home, that's a false media narrative. Just check that off the box. Yeah. It did not crush them. It actually hurt Bill Clinton to the point where Al Gore would not campaign with Bill Clinton, that's right. which was probably in all likelihood may have been the difference. That's right. In a few key states, it could have been the difference. That's right. And then uh, you go back a, a couple decades earlier, 1974, Democrats move forward with impeachment. Uh, but before the process gets to the floor, uh, Nixon resigns. And then what happens? Democrats do incredibly well in the midterm elections. And in 1976, then their majorities are massive and they win the White House. So in the two modern cases, uh, that's what you have. And it, it might turn out badly. I mean, look, I don't know. But the point is, it's not automatic how the politics unfold. I had, before you on a Democratic strategist, Tara Dudell, who's really nice. And she said her biggest concern, she wants impeachment too. Her just concern is that the Democrats are not great at framing mm -hmm. and staying on message. But the one beauty of impeachment is that's the message. Like, if you have these random hearings, my fear, Julian, is that it becomes this Benghazi-esque spectacle. There's hearings all over and people just 
tune it out and they go, ah, this is just politics as usual, as opposed to going, we have the report by Robert Mueller. We are now going to have hearings based on this very report focused on potential impeachment of the president of the United States of America. And you frame it like that and the media follows it. Americans get it. And you make a specific case. And I wonder in the impeachment, though, do you bring in what's going on in the Southern District of New York regarding Trump? And I mean specifically what was in the pleadings of the prosecutors that Donald Trump, individual number one, in their view, was involved in campaign election fraud close to Election Day with hush money payments. Maybe that's the only thing you sort of add. I don't get in. I don't think you bring in the inauguration stuff. And I don't know if you bring in the emoluments thing. I think you keep it to Mueller and what Mueller discovered because he discovered the Cohen stuff and farmed that out. I think they have to contain it both in scope and time. Uh, And I think you're right, because if it gets too unwieldy and and he will make it more unwieldy because he will (laughs) not participate in this process, that you can end up then politically, not only with Democrats looking like they're investigating everything possible, but it will actually keep going on and on. Uh, into the election. And and when you are doing impeachment, and everyone should be aware of this politically, it will be the number one issue. So right. candidates it overshadows have to, 2020. it's not like you're going to talk about Medicare for all when the House is getting close to vote. That will be the news uh, and that will be the story. So Democrats have to figure that out. But again, there are moments in American politics where you have a severe issue, a severe problem, and the party in power has to decide, are we going to do something about it? And sometimes you have to do something about it and risk the fallout. So what is the downside for the Democrats in the House just having a series of hearings and going, we're not going to do any impeachment stuff. We're putting the brakes on it. Or we don't even know if we're ever going to do it when nearly 70 percent of the Democratic base in a recent CNN poll says they want impeachment. What is the potential downside for Democrats? Well, the downside is Democrats are deflated at the same time uh, Trump's. Uh, supporters will be totally beyond excited. I don't know what the right word is to use. You probably can think Trumpian. of it. Trumpian. We don't right. know something. And then at the same time, he will use that. I mean, he will argue, Democrats should understand if they don't do anything, that he was right, this was fake, and he will say the Democrats are just out of control investigators anyway, uh, and the Democrats will have nothing on their own to really show for it. And so he will take that right to Election Day. I wrote somewhere on Twitter, I said, imagine like that all happens. He wins re-election. Uh, this is now legitimate, uh, and he's in, in 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 for a second term. I can't even imagine the insanity we would see and what he any yeah. whim that comes to mind. And then this has been legitimated. I mean, some people say, well, then you can start impeachment in 2020. What? I, yeah, well, in who? 2021, people were writing this. And I'm like, that's not really going to happen. No, that that's ridiculous. Who right. wrote that should never be able to write again? So they should you, not allow them to so write. This is the dumbest thing I've ever made. heard. And, uh, I don't know. You know, Speaker Pelosi is tough. She does understand, I think, what's at stake. I know. But I do think she is uh, politically fearful right now to move forward with it. <laughs> The timidity is the way you describe the Democratic leadership yep. forever. And Schumer, the same thing. The long-term serving people who come from a different generation, which is go along, get along. You can find bipartisanship. You can work out deals with the executive branch. And that would be great. I wish we had that. It's not with Trump. You can't do it. And I want to play this quick clip. This is Elijah Cummings on Sunday on Face the Nation. I love this clip about if they don't do anything, what will Trump will do? And what will it indicate to Donald Trump and his brain? So clip number three. Now that we, are, we know all the information that we, we, we know, we can't just allow this to go on and on. If the president, if we do nothing here, what is going to happen is that the president is going to be emboldened. He's going to be emboldened because he said, well, I got away with that. And then the people who, his aiders and abettors, that is, the, that the Republicans uh, in the Congress, they'll say, oh, he is pretty strong, and they'll continue to go along uh, with him. We cannot afford that. Our democracy cannot afford that. And that was Sunday before the absolute stonewalling that's over yeah. happened the last three days. I think Elijah Cummings put it perfectly and he knows exactly, now he's being sued by Trump over documents he wants from the in, the accounting firm of Trump. That's so much of this. You've emboldened a monster, a corrupt person who should not be in the White House. And but let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about Trump today saying no to subpoenas And for the last three days, stonewalling Democrats on everything. From an historical point of view, is this uh, way abnormal? Have you ever seen this? We'll come back with Julian Zillizer. He'll break this all down after this. You're listening to the Dino Bidala Show, where we crush Trump's lies every single day. On Sirius XM Progress 127.
to the Dean Obidala Show on Sirius XM Progress. And welcome back to the Dean Obidala Show. We're here with Julian Zelizer, CNN contributor. See him all the time there. Princeton University professor. And my niece is applying to Princeton, by the way, so we can, we'll talk about that later. And uh, so... You touched on something in the break. It's always, folks, the best stuff is always in the break. You always see like hosts like Joy Reid, in the break we just said this, or Reverend Al does the same thing. You talked about it took impeachment hearings of Nixon to push Republicans to finally come on board and go to Nixon and say your time is up. Explain a little bit more. Expand on that a little bit. Right. Uh, people think that this was some big bipartisan time and and Republicans just went along with the impeachment as it unfolded and they were all worked up about Nixon. That's not what happened. Republican support held pretty firm for the president. The, many Republicans in Congress were attacking the whole thing yep. as a partisan hit job. And you can look at the polls and it's really not until July this is a few days before he, a few weeks before he resigns, that you see Republicans start to turn, that you see public opinion beyond Democrats start to say impeachment is plausible. And finally, you see Republicans approach the president and say, step down. That only happens after the impeachment, uh, after the Judiciary Committee conducted its own impeachment investigation. And after the vote started. So basically, you have to force the hand of the other party if they are being resistant to the reality of what's going on in the White House. If the Democrats don't do anything, Republicans won't do anything. Of course either. not. There's no reason for them to. So uh, th there is a kind of part of not having impeachment that's very detrimental to this ever changing. And if you had impeachment hearings and you had articles of impeachment drafted and they vote in the House to impeach Trump, which is simply an indictment, it goes to the Senate for the trial. There are senators that are GOP that are up for re-election in states that it might be some tight pressure, a little bit, a little like Tom Tillis, North Carolina, yep. Cory Gardner in, in Colorado, Susan Collins in Maine. Um, there are a couple of others that escape me that are states that, oh, uh, Martha McSally in Arizona was just appointed there. So she's just, uh, she'd lost her own election, then she got appointed. I don't think you get to 20, but maybe with Mitt Romney and those, you get to five. Maybe there's a point where enough evidence just comes out and the American people see it and you see his numbers start to really plummet. And politicians are about getting reelected. If they think it's in their best interest now to go against whoever the president is, I assume that's when the calculation comes into it and they go, well, got to go. It could be. Uh, I don't know if you'll ever get the numbers at this point for uh, actually impeaching. You might. Who knows? It wasn't as if everyone predicted Nixon was going to hit that precipice of having to resign. No one thought that was going to happen. So who knows what's going to happen? But that's not how you think as a party. If there is something that has to be done, you do it. And uh, you put your own party on record and you see where the Republicans are by the time it ends, if they're really that blinded by partisan loyalty. Look, if it, uh, some Democrats say, well, if we do all this and it goes to the Senate and it doesn't go through, President Trump will just claim victory and it will get even worse. He's already claiming victory. That's right. So it doesn't matter. You you at least want to go through with the process at this point. This is a substantial. What, what could accusation. be worse? He dissolves Congress like a king. Right. I mean, he just put right. executive order. Congress, you're gone. You losers. You're out. Right. Hashtag I'm king. The when I look at what happened, it was a five week trial for Bill Clinton. Yeah. Uh, January 7th, 1999 to February 12th, and they ultimately voted. They didn't even get a majority on either of the two articles of impeachment. One was dead even, and one was 45 Democrats. And 10 Republicans voted not guilty uh, on the first count. And from an objective point of view, Bill Clinton lied under oath. There's no real dispute. He'd committed crimes, but it was not enough to remove him as president. I don't know if the Senate gets to this point and goes, you know, there are crimes here. It's just not enough to remove him in a good faith basis. Perhaps they do, perhaps they don't. But if the American people see this 400 plus page report down to a few articles of impeachment that everyone could read and see, I think it makes the case more persuasive what this guy is and the crimes that we view that he has committed. Well, that's the point of congressional hearings. I mean, the point when they work well is to explain to the public what's at stake and to use hearings as a platform. It doesn't always work for sure, but as a platform to explain to voters what's going on here and to lay out a case like lawyers would, but in a public court about why uh, impeachment has to or, or doesn't have to happen. That's that's really up to the committee. 
Um, but when you don't have that, you just have a report. I do. Most people aren't reading through the report, no. and, and it is long, and it's complicated, and so you're kind of leaving many voters in a bad position that way. And I think there's an obligation now for Congress to to sort through that. And now you have Trump stonewalling to levels that I, I'm not familiar with. I, w- I want to play a clip of Trump where I call him the orange-haired white walker. Here he is today talking about, and we're watching it on CNN playing right now, and I'm about to play it, saying no to the subpoena, and then trying to make this into a partisan, make it all, it's all partisan anyway, so who cares? Here's clip number five, please. But we're fighting all the subpoenas. Look, these aren't like impartial people. The Democrats are trying to win 2020. They're not going to win with the people that I see, and they're not going to win against me. The only way they can maybe luck out, and I don't think that's going to happen, it might make it even the opposite, that's what a lot of people are saying, the only way they can luck out is by constantly going after me on nonsense. He's calling the Democrats partisan, which is kind of laughable. The, the some people are saying, which is his other his alternative ego, I guess, his alter ego. But the idea, of, I'm not gonna, I'm saying no to all subpoenas, and we're seeing that backed up in their actions, with not allowing Carl Klein to testify, personal White House personal security director, just saying nope, no tax returns. Elijah Cummings, oversight committee ser- serves subpoenas, duly authorized subpoenas on Trump's accounting firms, and Trump sues. House Oversight Committee and Elijah Cummings. Well, you're not getting that. We'll see what a court says ultimately. And Trump says now no to subpoenas. It's absolute stonewalling. Have we? I've seen presidents say no, even President Obama, no to specific things. But this, no, we're giving you nothing and you're going to like it. Right. Have you seen this? No, it's usually more targeted. So you've had battles over executive privilege. And uh, Eisenhower, for example, wouldn't give... Uh, documents or allow people to testify before the McCarthy committee in 1954. And he claimed national security Hmm. as a way to stop it. Uh, And then Nixon is the famous case. Congress knew there were these tapes. We wanted the tapes. Prosecutor wanted the tapes. A court wanted the tapes. He said no. And the Supreme Court decided unanimously, you have to give over the tapes. Um, And then Clinton actually tries uh, to invoke executive privilege during the Lewinsky scandal, and he loses in court. So you have seen it. This is definitely more of a just blanket statement. There's not really a justification for no documents, no testimony to any committee. Uh, And so it doesn't have that kind of precision. And then again, you, you layer that onto the way in which he's flexing presidential power and the, the closest comparison, I think, is obviously Nixon and the audio tapes in terms of what you're looking I, I, at. I think the closest comparison is probably other third world countries <laughs> that have turned into authoritarian nightmares. The with, you know, early in the show, I, I went through there was a great article in The Washington Post, but it linked to a really better congressional research service report on what Congress's power is in trying to compel a president and an executive branch to do something. And there's actually a federal statute which gives Congress a, an opportunity to actually certify criminal contempt. It's a misdemeanor, though. It's up to one year, but still a year in prison. Now, Trump can't be charged with it. We know that. DOJ. The problem is, if, say, House Oversight certifies that Mnuchin is in violation, then it goes to the DOJ. Right. And the DOJ's got to act on it. And invariably, every time the DOJs, they're part of the executive branch, they go, nope, we're not going to do it. So they have to just sue the person civilly. But here's the worst case. And Joseph Stiglitz brought this up today when I talked to him. He goes, and he goes, the worst case is, say they actually prosecute say Steve Mnuchin and he gets convicted. Trump just pardons him the next day and he just leave, walks out of the, the prison. It doesn't even matter. This right. is so above this is so above the law, it is horrible to believe that this is our system right now. It is so I think there was an assumption in our system that we would never have someone like Trump in the White House. Right. Because this goes it's there was a lot of accepting of norms and forbearance in a way is the term I think in uh, how democracies die, that certain leaders would forbear, have forbearance or not do certain things. Trump does it all. Whatever whimsical thing there is, he does. And no one contemplated this. And our laws show that there's gaps in that need to be corrected after this guy's gone. Yeah, and he can drag, if it goes that route, that will be dragged on for, for a years. long time. Yeah, it could go through to 2021 is when he'd want to attend because then you have a new Congress and all the subpoenas are uh, irrelevant, I believe. 
Um, but it, it won't kind of bring the resolution of facts that the Democrats are looking for. But Democrats are not dealing with a rational actor. I mean, I think what you're saying is important. They keep thinking it's the 90s or is it the 70s? <laughs> Even I'm talking that way. This is a different person. And he will do whatever he's allowed to do. That's how he operates. If, if he can do it, he'll go there. We have to have some analogy to and, make it like where people yeah. get how – potentially dangerous Trump is it like well, sort of like Halloween movies maybe Friday the 13th I'm trying to think like how this guy there's a monster in the house he is dangerous nothing is off limits and the people who didn't do what he wanted are all gone from the White House in that right. report who are like I love the things that Chris Christie comes out as like a good guy he's like I'm not doing that I'm not telling stuff like to Jeff Sessions he's like I'm, right. I thought this was nuts I'm it's never a really low bar to be a good guy you know here and it's a great point today the acting DHS secretary was interviewed on right. NBC by Lester Holt. And he asked the question, would you do anything illegal? And he goes, I will not do anything illegal. It doesn't matter who asked me. And I applauded. I'm like, this is where I am. I'm applauding a guy who goes, I won't commit a crime because the president asked me to because there's other people that would. Right. And that, look, everything that you are saying on the one hand, it's funny or it's shocking. But it's also just if you step back and what is this doing to our dem democratic institutions? It's not healthy. Uh, and it's not as if this all bounces back instantly when someone has done all this. And so back to the first part of the conversation, that's why Democrats can't just put this aside and say we're moving on. Uh, as this unfolds, you're seeing how bad the situation is because of how he responds to the investigation. I can't even predict what this man will do next. I can't predict what he will do to stay in power. Think about it. Nobody wants to lose the presidency. Add to that that he's hearing that he's going to be charged with crimes when he leaves the White House. Yeah. And that there's also some arguments, and I don't think they're accurate, but they're out there, that somehow the statute of limitations might expire if he gets reelected for, like, campaign finance violation is only five years. I think it actually might toll, but in any event, he hears that. Nothing's off the table. I mean, it's right. really a scary scenario. We have no idea. We had someone call earlier, and I can't disagree with it because Michael Cohen warned us that if Trump loses, he might not leave the White House. How do you, and we've never had that, because right. what if, because what are this scenario, Julian, and this is completely plausible, he loses by, Locked he wins, what if he office. wins the, no, but what if yeah. he won, what if it was reverse? he won the popular vote but lost the electoral college? Yeah. Do you think he, no, the American people want no, me. He, it doesn't matter. I, no, I know, or, or what if, right. or what if it comes down to one state? Yeah. And it's close, like a George oh, Bush. Well then, then you're going to see a 2000 remake. Right. I mean, he will unleash a legal uh, onslaught if there's any way to contest the election. That's for sure. But if he loses, he's gone. I mean, that's the But great, how do you get him out of there? I mean, they will escort him out. I mean, it would be quite a sight. How great would that be? Right? Oh but my when God. you're done with the presidency, you're no longer the president. You no longer have that power. And it's something you hear from everyone who's worked in the White House. Oh, you know, it's interesting. You're right. It's not that President Obama at the end of his term gave back like the key or, right. or no, 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 the no, no. medal like right. they just swear somebody else in per the right. constitution in january of 2021 you so you're powerless so you're just a guy you're a squatter right. at that point that's exactly and then right. they tackle him and drag him out oh folks that come on how much fun would that be sincerely trump won't leave a new president comes in and they have to send in the swat team and it's a scarface scenario and then they get him out a dream come true. This is, makes me giddy. I'm actually happy now. Julian, you brought me some <laughs> some joy. All right, let's take a break and come back and talk about Joe Biden getting into the race. That's going to be the big news. I think it's tomorrow the video is coming out, I've yeah. heard. And the first event is Monday, it seems. But I want to get into that and what we're seeing. And also, how do you think these candidates must feel about the specter of being overshadowed completely for six or seven months? You know, that's easily what would happen. Mm -hmm. Let's take a break, come back with our friend Julian. At this point, the question is not who connected to Donald Trump as a criminal. The question is, is anyone connected to Donald Trump who's not a criminal? The Dean Obidala Show. Sirius XM Progress.
You're listening to The Dino Bidala Show, Sirius XM's Progress. Welcome back to Dino Bidala Show. Julian Zellerzer is here from CNN. I've decided, Julian, that if radio doesn't work out, I'm going to start a daycare business. That's really where the money is, apparently. We were just chatting about that. So, so let's talk about Joe Biden getting into the race uh, tomorrow. He's at, in most polls, the average on RCP is around 30% which is pretty good when there's like 75 right. candidates. I mean, it's remarkable. Like every, Democrats are not running, just announced at this point. We assume you're running if you're a Democrat and you have any value anywhere. What what should we look for? Because it's speculation, but what do you think we should look for in terms of getting a sense of his support is, is strong or it's name recognition only in terms of watching the polls in the next few weeks as he's out there in the campaign trail? Well, it should go up a lot, meaning his only uh, claim at this point is he's the most winnable candidate. He's not saying anything else. So once he's actually in this, I would want to see, is that true? Not just does he hold, but that enthusiasm should go up and it should overwhelm Bernie Sanders. It should overwhelm everyone. That would be a measure that there's something there uh, in the polls. And I don't like to usually talk about fundraising, but for him, it's really important because he doesn't have small donations like everyone else is right. joined. So can he do any of that? Not a lot of people think he can. He's not a very good fundraiser on the other end either. So it'll be important early on to see, not just for the money itself, but politically, can he do uh, that kind of campaigning? And I'm also curious as how the others react, how tough they are with him. That's I'm looking at Because he's too. vulnerable in a million ways. And I don't know if the other candidates are going to sit it out for a while uh, and be civil, uh, or they're going to go right after him and bring out all those weaknesses to cut him down to size. If they've learned nothing from Trump and the GOP in 2016, Trump was the front runner and they still didn't take him seriously for so yeah. many reasons. Like, we want his supporters. He's going to melt down. We're going to win all that. If you're in this to win, we're going to find out who's in it to win of the Democrats, who's in it for book deals and contributorships. Right. Because if you're in it to win, you're going to go after Biden hard. If you're just in it to be, maybe to be VP one day or raise your stature to help yourself to run for Senate in your home state or governor one day, you don't go after Biden. You just keep talking. But you know what I found interesting? The last time Democrats nominate, I just saw this recently and it stunned me, but it made all the sense in the world. The last time Democrats nominated a white male to be for president, 2004. Yeah. It's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. And this year, it's unclear why uh, that should be the winning ticket. I mean, the party is more diverse than ever before. Diversity itself is an issue. And so the party showing what it's about really matters when President Trump is the face of the Republican Party. And so it would be a big thing to kind of go uh, this route. Uh, and even Sanders, I mean, he's also uh, that category, but he's different. I mean, politically, he's different. He is a Jewish American. So even there, he's a little different. Uh, this is the most standard pick you can get. So it'd be a statement like that's where our safety is. That's our blanket. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I, I'm also just curious how he responds to all these parts of his record that really aren't great given where Democrats have evolved on criminal justice, on race, on Anita Hill. I want to hear what he has to say. I think if he just says the times have changed as he did with the hugging, I don't know. That doesn't uh, create confidence he'll make it through the primaries. Who do you think does he hurt if he starts moving up? I mean, whose lanes is he? It's not the Bernie lane. The Bernie lane's his, and the Liz Warren lane's differently a different lane. But is it is it Beto? If he if he goes out and Biden is able to, and I'm, I'm, I have nothing for or against him. I yeah. just want to see how it goes. Say he goes out there and he does a really good job, exceeds expectations. Yep. Who do you think he starts taking from? I, ima- yeah, I think Amy Klobuchar is gone almost. I think that Beto gets hurt a great deal from this. Yeah, he takes, uh, he, he's uh, going to be hurt. Uh, Klobuchar would be devastated because they're basically a similar uh, mm-hmm. pitch uh, for the party. Probably Buttigieg. Uh, Think so? He's still different. I mean, he's he part no of our so It's remarkable. And, uh, right. So, and uh, Harris, that's the one. I think that's the kind you of You think figure. Harris could hurt? That he he should would, hurt Harris. Yeah. Oh, I didn't if think he does that. well, he will overshadow everyone who isn't uh, with a bright, shiny light on them. And she's not there yet. And so I think the coverage of him, the focus on him as the winner, that could hurt her. Because she's a coalitional candidate. You can imagine her actually winning. But this will hurt her. I think this will hurt her. And, and as someone, you work in the media now for years and you've yeah. watched the media, 
the media covers the front runner more than anyone. Right. When so when the front runner gets in, and people might be like, "Why are they covering Joe Biden?" And they're he's a white male, all this kind of stuff. They cover the front runner. If someone were to eclipse Joe Biden, if all of a sudden Senator Harris becomes a front runner. Yeah. And if she didn't get the coverage, then you could say, "Hey, this is outright racism and sexism going on." But our media goes to the front runner. That's the way it always works. That's why they're not covering John Delaney and Andrew Yang and. and a bunch of the t- bottom tier ones, yeah. they just don't cover them. I think it, the I would say it could hurt Warren too, because I think Warren is potentially like a sleeper front runner, uh, and she needs more time. People need to. She's very skilled as a campaigner. She's very smart. Yes, and even though she's to the left. I could imagine her bringing the whole Democratic Party behind her. She's shrewd, and her ideas are kind of universal. But if he's in. And she's now where she is. She's kind of struggling. It's going to be hard to so come he back. Takes, so the bottom line is he sucks up the oxygen yeah. of the media. So you might be coming out with great policy proposals right now and getting a little coverage. But when Biden's there and if he's still polling at 30 percent and there's 20 candidates, he's far and away yeah. the leader. And then you got Bernie about 10 points behind. And then it's a stew of people from 10 to 5 to 3. You know, it's interesting. The concern, of course, among Democrats who want to win, and we all do, is that we unite whoever the nominee yep. is. And I chatted with New Hampshire Democratic Chair Ray Buckley, who's been around a long time. He made an interesting point. I want to see what you think from a historical point of view. I talked about how do we avoid the Bernie Hillary thing. He goes, easy. We're not going to have just two candidates. He goes, when we've had one against one, it's caused a rift that somehow sometimes is harder to heal. When you have 10, or he goes, 20, it's much different. It's not unless that person becomes like a villain, it's not going to be like that. You've got a whole bunch of other people who go like, well, that person didn't really beat my candidate. They beat everyone in the field and whatever. What do you think based on history, the idea of one versus one versus one in a field of 15? I think that that's a good point. I don't think it will be the same. And it's not an open seat presidential race like 2008, which was the primary with Hillary and uh, Obama that mm-hmm. got very de- divisive. That's right. We don't even talk about that one. So right. there will be someone from September to November that every Democrat will be reminded of, President Trump. And so I think whatever happens in the next few months, no matter how bitter it gets and any fault lines that emerge, I think once the fall comes around, you're going to see Democrats unite. I think it's also that's a case why it doesn't have to be Biden. Uh, I don't think Democrats are somehow not going to be enthused by one of these other very good candidates uh, once election time comes. It's going to be interesting. And I think we're going to see, I, I'll make a prediction here you know, a couple minutes before the break, that Democrats don't go after Biden until the first debates in June. That could that be. The next two months, you, they just do their thing, stay positive. And because they're going to town halls now, like they were one of today, the She the People thing, there's eight people. They're not attacking each other at all. I watch them at the National Action Network. They're all doing their affirmative message. In two or three months from now, when money's getting tighter, you're not getting the press coverage, you have to go out to the front runner. I mean, yes. that's sort of, that's the, you don't, you got to punch up. You're not going to punch at someone with 3%. You're going to punch at someone with 30%. And you're going to hear this stew of voice, like a buffet of voices going at Biden then. And that's going to be the question. How does he respond? I don't know. Uh, he hasn't responded well in previous elections. <laughs> no. He's done horribly. He's not a good campaigner. So I'm not one who says, boy, when that comes, he's going to be able to swipe it all away. Uh, he could fall apart on that debate stage very easily or look just kind of weak and not interesting. So it's not inevitable he'll do well. The best thing for Biden would have been to announce November 2nd, 2020, like the day before the election. Right. And right. just be like, I'm running. The guy and then they go, the hey, end. that's great. He's a good guy. And everyone likes, why not do it? But uh, all right, let's take a break and come back with our friend Julian Zelizer. Dean Obadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127.
Dean Ogadala Show on Sirius XM Progress 127. And welcome back. Dean Obidala Show. We're live Wednesday, April 24th. Tara Dadella, who was just on, is now on MS. We're looking up like she was right across the street. So Julian Zellers is here from CNN. Julian, you know, this, I don't know what the next week or two is going to bring, but I think looking at the poll numbers for Biden when he jumps in is really important for people to see if he stays at frontrunner status. And if he starts moving up, because Tara thought he's going to start sliding. But if he starts moving up, that's a remarkably good sign for him. Absolutely. It's all for him. It's purely about winning, not ideas, not excitement. It's he's the guy to go in. If he slides, then it will go fast. But if he can hold, I think you can see him maybe to Super Tuesday. I, I wish if Joe Biden does a good job and runs a good campaign, I hope a lot of it is that he's actually starting to articulate policies that are more progressive than we know him to be yeah. to get the base more excited. Because but they're not. The can like, not the, that we candidate. need right. The idea we need to fall in love is partly true about Democrats, but at the same time, we need a candidate that's going to enthuse us to come out and want to knock on doors. And I know getting rid of Trump might do that enough. Yeah. But it would be so great though if we had a candidate that we're all like, or most of us like, I am so excited. We're going to do this, and I'm so proud of this person. They're going to be great, and they're transformative, and everything we can hope for them. The way we hope for Obama in 2008 right. and 12, and some help for Hillary Clinton is going to break the glass ceiling. It would be remarkable. I'm hoping, but if Biden's the nominee, I 100% support him no matter what. Julian, thanks very much for coming. Read Julian Zelizer's stuff at me. CNN. Also, he writes for The Atlantic and other places too, but CNN all the time, like 10 articles a day. And Twitter, get, at Julian Zelizer. At Julian Zelizer Easy. on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I'm going to try tomorrow to pivot to another issue for three nights. We've been talking this. I've been so angry and obsessed with it. We're going to talk about Joe Biden tomorrow collectively. He's going to announce, and I really want to hear from the progressives. What do you think? Are you excited about him or not now that he'll formally be a candidate by this time tomorrow night? Have a great night. Thank you so much for listening. I'm on Twitter at Dean Obidollar or Dean at DeanOfRadio.com. Drop me an email.